This podfast is a summary of a conversation between Tim Ferriss and Dr. Peter Atia. In this episode, Tim and Peter will go over some preventative medicine and practices known as Medicine 3.0, which will help us develop strategies and tactics to improve the quality of our diet, our exercise, and our sources of medical and nutritional information to live a longer, healthier life. Six Big Ideas from Tim Ferriss and Dr. Peter Adia. Big Idea Number 6, Medicine 3.0. We can think of medicine as having three non-discrete periods— Medicine 1.0, which is the era before the transition period of the late 17th century to the late 19th century, where medicine had no scientific basis, and doctors relied on rationalization, gods, and bad humors to explain diseases. Arguably, the most significant insight of Medicine 1.0 can be attributed to Hippocrates, thousands of years ago, who was the first to believe that diseases were caused by nature and not by gods. Medicine 2.0 began in the 17th century with Francis Bacon's push towards the scientific method. This period marked the most significant advancement in the study of microorganisms like viruses and bacteria, where doctors started washing their hands, and the discovery of antibiotics and vaccines cut the mortality rate down by half and doubled life expectancy. In Medicine 2.0, there were many successes, such as the treatment of hepatitis C, which only 25 years ago was considered incurable, and the treatment of HIV, which can now be rendered a chronic disease. However, this era has not been successful in addressing chronic diseases such as cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, and type 2 diabetes. Medicine 3.0, which we are currently in the process of transitioning into, is where personalized and preventative medicine is starting to be used to tackle chronic diseases. Personalized medicine will involve the use of genomic testing, which will enable doctors to identify diseases early and offer early intervention. It will also help doctors to understand why a patient responds to a specific treatment and why they don't. Preventative medicine will involve lifestyle changes that will reduce the risk of developing chronic diseases such as type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. Medicine 3.0 will also require collaboration between patients, doctors, and technology to create a healthcare system that will be effective in addressing chronic diseases. Big idea number five, develop strategies and tactics to achieve your objectives. If you had a very big objective, let's say you wanted to live longer, and based on this very large objective, you had to come up with tactics such as what to eat, how to exercise, or what supplements to take, the probability of coming up with the correct set of instructions is very small, even when provided with a list of options to choose from. Also, not having a clear strategy will seriously reduce the probability of compliance. However, if you were to break down your large objective into the most common causes of death, you would come up with some revealing statistics— you would be faced with about an 80% chance of dying from atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, cancer, neurodegenerative disease, metabolic diseases such as type 2 diabetes, or accidental death. Data on chronic diseases makes it unambiguously clear that it is better to spend more time without the disease than to attempt to extend the period of time you live with the disease. So with this information, you can consider how nutrition, pharmacology, exercise, and other behaviors affect the drivers of the above causes of death and develop tactics that are in line with your strategy. When it comes to accidental death, as simple as it may seem, reducing the amount of time spent in an automobile when traveling, the leading cause of accidental death, will reduce your probability of this being your cause of death. Big idea number four, CGMs as a tool to regulate macronutrients. Continuous glucose monitors, CGMs, are devices that measure glucose levels in real time by using a tiny filament in the subcutaneous space to sample, not blood, but interstitial fluid, a fluid between cells. They were initially developed for people with type 1 diabetes but have expanded to a much larger market of people with type 2 diabetes and are recently being used by people without diabetes because they give a more accurate measurement of the average blood glucose, which makes it helpful in knowing what to eat, as not all foods are created equal when it comes to managing glucose homeostasis. People are often quite surprised to realize how a snack of chocolate-covered raisins, a high-intensity training session, or a poor night's sleep can drive their blood glucose up. 
By having a real-time reading of a person's blood glucose level, GCMs help compliance by acting more like a behavioral tool. The user might think twice before eating something they're not supposed to. This reactivity is known as the Hawthorne effect, in which individuals modify an aspect of their behavior in response to their awareness of being observed. Are GCMs necessary for people without diabetes? No, but they do act as a tool to regulate one of the four macronutrients. And for those afraid of needles, with the latest generation of CGMs, you'll barely feel anything at all. Big idea number three, increase your medical literacy. Gaining medical literacy is not a simple task and requires effort to overcome the semantic problem of learning a new language. It is not necessary to learn all the Greek and Latin words that medical students learn, but learning the meaning of words such as proximal and distal does help to further understand medical concepts. The most useful way to gain medical literacy, however, is reading case studies on publications. Dr. Atia and Bob Kaplan wrote a five-part blog series called Studying Studies, which is a great foundation to start understanding the basics. What is a base cohort study? What is observational epidemiology? What types of bias exist, and how do you look for them? You can start going over the information in this blog series to obtain the foundational knowledge set, and then, much like with exercise, work on repetition. Lane Norton has a scientific literacy course that helps you read studies about exercise and nutrition, and Dr. Atia puts out a weekly newsletter every Sunday that analyzes studies on drugs, exercises, or supplements. Gaining medical literacy is not unlike learning Japanese. If a person were to set themselves the goal of being conversationally fluent, which means they understand and can convey about 80% of what they hear or want to say in a conversation, that does not include abstract terminology like economics or art. If they committed to three to four hours a week for three to six months, they could achieve their goal. To gain medical literacy, start with Dr. Adia's episode number 188, How to Read and Understand Scientific Studies. Read some of the case studies from the newsletter and maybe read a book like Bad Science by Ben Goldacre. If you make this literacy your very light part-time job for three months, it's sure to be one of the best investments you'll ever make in your life. Big idea number two. Alcohol is not good for you in any dose, so just focus on being thoughtful and deliberate about the choices you make. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't drink it at all. It just means we shouldn't lie to ourselves into thinking it's healthy in low doses because it's not. It's a toxin. So with that in mind, let's go over frequency, and dose. This is what defines the poison. Have between zero and two drinks a day, but no more than two in a day. Try not to drink on more than three days a week, and at the end of the week, you shouldn't be having more than about seven drinks total. Also, remember that having seven drinks in one day is very different than one drink a day for seven days. Don't drink alcohol a good three hours before sleep. It will affect the quality of your sleep and affect your circadian rhythm. And when it comes to types of alcohol, tequila, mezcal, wine, and dark Belgian beer are all bad. Alcohol is alcohol. These are general principles. There are going to be times when you violate them, and that's okay. Just be thoughtful and deliberate about the choices you make. Big idea number one, VO2. Max and muscular strength are two of the most underutilized metrics for improving our health. These two have more of a positive impact on your lifespan than any other thing we can think of has a negative impact. That includes needing a kidney, having high blood pressure, diabetes, and obesity. VO2 max is the max amount of oxygen a person can intake. Use rate of perceived exertion, RPE, to gauge the intensity of your workouts, as it is far more accurate than heart rate. Here's how to get a feel for it. For low-intensity workout, you should be able to talk, but you don't want to. If you're able to easily talk, it's too light. If you can't talk at all, it's too hard. Do that for three 45-minute sessions or three 60-minute sessions. For peak workout, do an exercise you can barely do four minutes of rest four minutes and do that four times. This should be done once a week. Strength is divided into eccentric and concentric phases of muscle movement as they contract and expand. Consider a broad jump where you need to make an enormous explosion of strength when you jump, and absorbing the shock as you land is an enormous eccentric ask. Another example of these concepts is walking up and down stairs. 
So as a principal in strength training, always be doing both. Step-ups are great, rucking is great, and be able to carry half your body weight in each hand for a minute. Thank you for listening to this podfast summary of the conversation between Tim Ferriss and Dr. Peter Adia. If you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. See you next time.